I'm Antoinette James, reporter in Heiwakapu Tanga jurisdiction. Welcome to Behind the Beehive, where I look behind the corporation jurisdiction's political show and try and reveal the truth. Today, part two in a five-part series on King Charles III coronation. Uh, today, we're going to be looking at the Abbey. The Abbey, once you understand a little bit about the Abbey, it becomes a little bit more uh, easier to understand all the other, um, shall we say, uh, symbolism uh, hidden in plain sight that doesn't necessarily belong to our culture, certainly not British culture, uh, but not our culture in the West, not our culture in New Zealand. This, what we're looking at as the elite's culture, it's superimposed over our culture. Pagan Rome, uh, they, when they conquered, they just allowed people to keep the same names, but uh, they had uh, their own pagan ancient mystery religion superimposed over the whole thing. So if you didn't really understand, you'd think your culture just carries on the same. And you think when they're talking about uh, your God, um, that they're meaning your God. So when we hear um, in the coronation, for example, they're talking about God, they're talking about Jesus Christ, Jesus our Lord, they will be seeing those names in their own uh, religion. They will not be seeing it as we see it from the King James Bible as a Christian, um, uh, the Christian gospel. So we're going to unpack the, the uh, Abbey a little bit. Um, it is um, a, uh, a place where uh, many uh, kings have been a throne uh, had their coronation but the throne itself I know people are becoming very anti-monarchy uh, the British monarchy is still here uh, it is the only monarchy that basically is if we look at uh, some of the monarchs uh, some of the thrones around Europe we will notice one by one they've all gone they've either had their heads removed they've been shot they have been removed through a revolution. We also know that the throne of Britain will remain because it is an extension of the throne of David. That is the uh, King David of BC times. And we read that in the Bible. Now, remember the Bible is an ancient text. You may not see it as the word of God, but uh, you would be foolish to disregard it. It's still an ancient text. It is history. And in uh, oh, Ezekiel, um, Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah, we hear many times about uh, the throne of David and where his throne will be seated. You'll hear things like the isles to the north, the isles to the west, uh, the isles in the sea, uh, the land of the north, the wilderness. All these uh, talk about Britain. Uh, and I will perhaps in another uh, video talk about how David's line got there. The throne has been hijacked. Um, the coronation is uh, choreographed from the city of London. We mentioned that a little bit last in the last video in the introductionary visit video because of the screen was a donation paid for uh, and, you, uh, and asked to be put in by the city of London. Who owns the city of London? The Vatican. We're talking about the Jesuits. So getting back to the site, the Abbey, it has been, been the site of coronations of the monarchies of Britain for some 700 years. Now, you must remember that uh, when the Abbey was built, uh, this was pre the Reformation, Martin Luther's Reformation of uh, just over 200, uh, 500 years ago. Um, and it was a Roman Catholic abbey. Uh, and you will know if you've read my book, We Are Revolting, or seen my other videos, that Roman Catholicism, the esoteric knowledge held by the inner, you know, the upper levels, not the blue levels, the upper levels, is ancient mystery religion. When they talk about Jesus, they're talking about Tammuz. When they're talking about uh, um, Mary, they're talking about Isis or Ishtar. Uh, they're talking about Nimrod. They're talking about Osiris. 
uh, this is the esoteric knowledge. And once we understand that, we will understand that this coronation has two levels that we can unpack. And we're, we're unpacking the esoteric. Uh, the Abbey is a, a Catholic temple, really, if you really want to get down to it, of esoteric symbolism uh, that's now being boldly unwrapped uh, for us, hidden in plain sight. The Abbey started off as a tiny little church uh, where, where we see it now. And that little church was dedicated to St. Peter. Hmm. St. Peter, where does that come from? Ah, St. Peter's Square, Vatican City. So, you know, it's about grabbing the moment in any country that you get to. We see that in the, the uh, Washington DC too. So it was dedicated to St. Peter. Now, Peter, uh, uh, the popes tell us, was the first uh, uh, pope. Well, he wasn't, he never went to Rome. But the, the, the Peter that did was Simon Magnus. And we see him and read about him in the book of Acts. He was a sorcerer who paid, or at least wanted, to pay for the, uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit so he could continue in his sorcery with greater gusto. The other thing we need to know about uh, these amazing Gothic buildings, I love Gothic buildings, so don't get me wrong, I, I do love them, but we need to know what they stem from. All these cathedrals and abbeys are always built on ancient mystery religion sites. Now, why would you do that if this has got anything to do with Christianity, if this has got anything to do with Jesus Christ of the Bible who came and died for us to, to save us from our sins and uh, give us uh, eternal life? The site is called Thorny Island because it really was just a kind of lagoony, sort of marshy part of the Thames, or a little bit more than marshy. You could get across there on a boat. So 1066, Edward the Confessor, uh, who started uh, the, uh, the Abbey, uh, he died. And uh, later on, Henry in 1154 came to the throne and he continued uh, Roman Catholic monks lived there because it was an abbey. That's where they lived. It was Henry the the Eighth that uh, 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 did the disillusionment of the uh, cathedrals and abbeys around Britain because the debauched behaviour of these monks and their prostitutes, being the nuns, was people wouldn't even speak of the debauchery and. The, the, the shocking um, pedophilia and, and sacrifice that went on in the bottom of these cathedrals and monasteries. And even Martin Luther, when he uh, hammered his uh, thesis on uh, Wittenberg Cathedral in Germany, uh, he had a lot to say about uh, monastic life and the debauchery that was there. So, you know, a lot of people say, oh, you know, Henry VIII, he, he ruined uh, and uh, demolished these beautiful architectural, Gothic uh, architectural cathedrals. But you could understand these were, these were monuments to debauchery, to Satanism. He uh, was the first monarch, really, that uh, disengaged himself from Rome and set himself up as the defender of the faith, the Christian faith, the Protestant faith. He was different um, uh, the, uh, as a defender of the faith. He was different in Protestant Christianity. He wasn't the, uh, the tyranny, the, the, the tyrant that uh, ruled over the whole country like the Pope was in his model of being the head of the Church of Rome. So it was uh, Henry VIII, and again, remember history is not black and white. There are always different worldviews. There are, there are strands of um, the secular with the strands of God's hand on the nations. He established the nations, many, many scriptures in the Bible about that which is why we can have confidence in New Zealand that Hei Wakaputanga was the beginning of the nation of New Zealand. He separates, separates the nation, uh, the Bible says. It was once uh, Queen Mary I uh, came to the throne after Henry VIII's death. 
she was unwell and, and only was on the throne very briefly. She had cancer and she died. In her time, the monks returned. And it was once Elizabeth I became queen that then the monks were removed. And from that time on, uh, she, her realm, she was very tolerant of Catholics, but she was very clear that Catholics were not going to rule the day. Um, now, the site of Westminster Abbey. In the seventh century, there's there's a there's a story uh, that was told, and it was a local fisherman called Edric, and he uh, he he ferried a stranger over to Thorn um, Thorny Island, and this stranger turned out to be St Peter. Who would have thought? Now we know St Peter pops up and comes to life and writes letters and gold from heaven calling uh, to uh, e.g. King Pepin, help the Pope because the Lombards are coming. So again, there's St. Peter. He's coming and going from heaven all the time. And he blessed Edric. And uh, he said he gave uh, Edric all this bountiful uh, salmon uh, catch because he told Edric to throw in the nets. So then he said to Edric, you take uh, the salmon to the Archbishop of um, uh, of West um, Westminster, or you know the church as it was right then, uh, and also um, uh, to the king. So apparently, it's then there is a Peter's Day at uh, at the Abbey, and. There are salmon is actually presented to the Abbey to commemorate this Roman Catholic event. Now, much later on in the 1700s, who do we hear but Sir Christopher Wren? Because there were needing to be a little bit of renovations on going on at the Abbey. Christopher Wren was the guy uh, when uh, St Paul's Protestant Cathedral in London was uh, damaged. He was the one that was brought in, that Masonic Mason, he was the one that was brought in to revamp it, to redesign it. And what did Christopher Wren do but make it a, the spitting image of the Vatican complete with the dome, which is ancient mystery religion. So there is Wren again getting his fingers on Westminster Abbey bringing in the esoteric knowledge of Catholicism, which is ancient mystery religion, which is Satanism, which is the, or Luciferianism, if you want to be a little bit softer, that many of the elite, if not all of them, worship today, including, I suggest, uh, our uh, beloved monarchy. We don't know the half of it. We live in this little capsule, this this little, uh, what I like to call uh, Plato's cave. We have no idea what's happening out there uh, over our heads. It is time to wake up. So let's have a look at some Luciferian aspects to the, the Abbey. We have the twin columns or the twin towers. Uh, they, they, they speak of uh, Jekin and uh, Boaz, which we see in Masonic masonry. Uh, you will notice in those towers we have round windows. And again, we're used to seeing those round windows. We just think, hey, that's really cool. But that speaks of sun worship. There's sun worship windows. They're, they're called rose windows, but there's sun worship windows. Uh, you will also notice that uh, the actual design of the abbey is in a cross. You know, you've got the nave and uh, you've got the side wings and all the when you uh, again have a look uh, at the design you'll see it's in a cross now a cross is one of the most satanic uh, luciferian ancient mystery religion um, uh, symbols out and that is why they crucified jesus on the cross it was the final victory of 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 satan over christ but of course it wasn't because he rose again black and white uh, floors speaks of dominion, of um, of uh, power, but really it's yin and yang. It's the two symbols. Again, yin and yang we think has come from Asian countries. It is way, way, way before any country was even established. This is ancient mystery religion that was taken out from the Tower of Babel when that, uh, the, the Babel, when the... the um, 
the uh, language was, were mixed and different people groups left the area. They took their ancient mystery religion with them. It became slightly different for each culture and that is the yin and the yang. The yin is the female, the negative or the moon uh, uh, being where we get Diana from, uh, William's um, mother and William was born at a high uh, sun uh, 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 part of the month and the yang is the male that's the positive that's the sun nothing by accident here people I don't know how they pull this off it's either witchcraft or they just manipulate people and make sure that they're pregnant at the right time but the yang is the, is the, the masculine uh, and uh, the, and that is the white the dark is the feminine and that is the black the left side of the body and the, the masculine is the right side of the body. Sun worship, esoteric Catholicism. Again, that's why the Pope or any uh, father and bishop hold the, the host up. They call it the host on there. It's got IHS, uh, which they tell us it's in his service. It isn't. It's Isis Horus Set. And they hold that up as sun worship. When you look at the, the monstrance, uh, you will see uh, the straight lines being the male and the curly lines be the female. Sun worship, by holding it up. It's all about sun worship. The host is Tammuz. They call him Jesus Christ. Remember pagan Rome, keep your names, but this is the esoteric knowledge. Freemasonry adopted uh, the symbol of yin and yang. Uh, and obviously, they, it's, it's to hide their, the meaning of the profane. Uh, Albert Pike, Mr. Masonic Mason himself, he says of the black and white pavements, he says the symbols, quote, the good and evil. Uh, so they know exactly what it's all about. Now, the Abbey, it's also, it's also a graveyard. It's also sitting with the dead. Uh, so who's buried there? Well, many famous people are buried there that would be far removed from Christianity that they could be. But I'm just going to pick up a couple today because they are of note. And one is Charles Darwin. He is buried there. He would be horrified to be buried there, quite frank frankly. But there was a lot of wheeling and dealing done. And he was um, uh, a lot of money given to uh, the uh, Bishop of Westminster to get him in there. Uh, uh, now, what did uh, Charles, he's most famous for evolution, that was chucked out at the time. People thought, you, uh, you've you got to be joking. But with the Rosicrucians and with the uh, Royal uh, Society of Science, uh, they wiggled their way in, they hijacked the whole of science. That's why, you know, we have this, you know, one science now, science doesn't work like that. Science is always shifting as new uh, things are found. But oh, no, no, they, the elites have got the science pretty well organized. So uh, climate warming and all this, you know, they've got it sorted. And won't be tied you if you say anything else will ruin your career. But his, his book, The Origin of the Species, by means of natural selection or the preservation of the favored races, in the struggle for life. That was his book. They Today we only know it of the origin of the species because they don't want to be that blatant. Uh, now, people, you and I aren't part of uh, the favoured race, by the way. That's the nobles. Why do you think we're all getting the um, clot shot? Why do you think we're being depopulated? Why do you think we're in the middle of genocide? We're not the favoured race. Uh, and he... Uh, Darwin uh, is responsible for that. He, he, he got it really from uh, Erasmus, his, his uh, grandfather, but he was the one that was promoted by uh, the Huxleys of this world, uh, um, known as uh, Darwin's Bulldog. So he was put there strategically buried in Westminster Abbey because they had to make him look A-OK -okay to fool us plebs. He was buried there um, so he wouldn't be forgotten. Uh, he was prominent in the public eye. He was buried there to give him prestige, uh, dependability, uh, to because uh, he was a very unstable guy. Uh, he was a haunted recluse. Uh, I go into this and we are revolting in quite a big way so you understand the whole hijack 
of science that was always connected to theology, always before the Rosicrucians got it and started destroying the whole thing. Um, the Abbey uh, gave him respect from the nation because he didn't have it at the time. So, you know, you let that generation die and others come in his place. Uh, um, it gave him a Christian veneer so people would see, oh no, this is okay. And around that time, that's when Christianity chucked out uh, creation science and brought in evolution. Uh, and in my book, I, I, there's plenty of citation and references and quotes uh, of people during that time who made it very clear that they knew exactly they, what, what they were going to do. They had to expunge Moses from science. They had to get rid of him. Another person that we'll find buried there, and that's Churchill. Now, we all love Sir Winston Churchill, don't we? We will fight them on the beaches. We will never surrender. He was a 33-degree Freemason. He was a Druid. His granddaughter, Edwina Sandy, she an uh, uh, artist, and she did a sculpture of a female Christ that you'll find in St. John the Divine in... Um, and New York, it did kind of go everywhere. It was a, a human outcry at the time. Uh, because you remember at Luciferianism, it's it's transgender, it's the whole the whole thing. So why not? Bethamit, their uh, their statue of um, uh, their god uh, is a male goat's head, female breasts. It all is ancient mystery religion. So you've got to ask yourself. Why are these people there? Because it's not a Christian, it's not a Protestant Christian church. Now, as I said, monks lived there and they were the Benedictine monks and they founded it in about 529. It was a uh, monastic order um, and uh, it was a Roman Catholic church, obviously, back then. Everything was before the Reformation. Uh, and uh, they followed the rule of St. Benedict, now, the Benedict monks, they wore black robes, hooded, long black robes. Oh, do you think we might have seen one of them walking past uh, the entrance of the abbey during the uh, coronation? I mentioned that in my introduction, not the Grim Reaper. I suggest a, a Jesuit slash Druid. He came with his long rod. And if, if you see him, you catch him, he's obviously walked like that. And as he gets to the door, do you notice he lifts his rod slightly and walks and glides himself across there? Ancient mystery religion. Anyway, they wore black um, uh, attire. Now, now, the rule of St. Benedict um, was written in Latin and, and it was, uh, you know, full of authority and... Um, uh, and meaning, and uh, their motto was, as part of this rule of Benedict, was uh, Pax Ora et Labora, Latin, excuse, I probably massacred that, Latin, and it means peace, prayer, and work. You plebs, you cannon fodder, just live in peace. Isn't that what the UN's all about? Peace, peace their peace by the way don't think it's our peace it's forced peace prayer you pray to lucifer we know from the likes of david's uh, sangler that if we don't take the luciferian uh, oath uh, we will not be part of the new world order and work what did um, um david rockefeller say we don't want thinkers we want workers that made me think, oh, very Agenda 2030, how progressive of them. But as we look more into the Abbey, we, we find that, that there's more clues to more dots all being pulled together to get that big picture. And we see a stained glass window there, one particular that I'm going to draw our attention to in this video. And it's in the Henry II's chapel there at Westminster Abbey. And it's a small stained glass window. And it's dedicated, well, it was um, um, paid for by uh, Dr. Mortimer Sackler. Now, the, uh, the Sackler family dynasty, who are they? I'd never heard of them before. 
Well, there he's a physician, the the original guy, um, philanthropist, of course. You know, a code for genicist and uh, 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 eugenics uh, um, creators of, uh, and he was a very generous donator to the Abbey's restoration. So it was very important to him. Now these aren't Christians, these these people. So again, why would they give such enormous amounts of money to a Christian church? Because it's not a Christian church. It's a Luciferian church, sadly. Um, now, what else is the Sackler family all about? They're big time pharmaceutical family. Big time pharmaceutical family. So we'll talk about that in a minute, but first let's just have a look at that window. Uh, it says M and T Sackler because uh, 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 Mortimer's wife was Teresa. It's um, you know beautiful name, but uh, usually a Catholic name. But who would know? I'm just throwing it out there. Um, and also the stained glass window said "Peace through Education." How United Nations of him. So it made me think of uh, um, the United Nations. Um, now, um, this window also fits in with uh, the United Nations uh, um, decade of education, United Nations decade of uh, health and pharmaceuticals and vaccinations. Uh, so it all is there. Peace through education. Um, but here's the deal. He didn't educate the doctors because the doctor, what Sackler was big time in was uh, uh, um, opioid uh, painkillers. Uh, and he didn't educate the doctors that these opioids were going to be extremely addictive uh, and uh, very bad for people's health. So peace through education, yeah, their peace through lack of education. You remember, for them, it's all, all about order out of chaos and you need to flip everything upside down. When it says peace through education, his signal is chaos through lack of of education. We're in a dumbed down educational system now. So let me read you uh, a little bit. According to the Centers of S Disease Control and Prevention, that's the CDC that have endorsed the shot, um, 47,000 Americans died as a result of opioid overdose since 2017 alone. Thank you, Sackler family. In 1999, just three years after OxyContin, that was the Sackler branding name, was introduced, there were 3,442 overdose deaths because it's so addictive and you've got to be very careful. So those, those are just the overdose. That number continued to rise year after year. The lawsuit involves more than 500 cities, counties and tribes from all across the US. This is from UNESCO, UN UNESCO. What have they got to say? As schools reopen, this is after COVID, we believe that peace education can be even more integrated with the national curricula and the broader learning environment to promote non-violence. Yeah, that means consent. That means don't be a dissident. That means, yes, we're putting in all these legislations and acts in place in all countries in the West so that you're not allowed to protest. If you say something against your government, you're a, a domestic terrorist. That's what they're talking about there. Uh, uh, the broader learning environment to promote nonviolence, conflict, resolution. Yep, you shush up, you. Don't you ever speak against the government. Uh, and compassion, their compassion. Equipping children from a young age, got to get them young, you know what uh, the Jesuits say, give me a child to the age of seven and he will be a Roman Catholic for life or ancient mystery believer for life. Um, from a young age with the skills to respect the dignity of others, that's the dignity of the elite, 
to key uh, uh, is key to building resilience and peaceful uh, education. Uh, peaceful education. Uh, education can impart the skills and values needed to prevent potential conflicts. Let's move on. We have a high altar. Sounds all very Catholic. It is. It's called a red table. Um, and it's got England's most oldest altarpiece. Uh, it was, uh, it's thought to be somewhere between 1270 and 1280. The panels, of course, has the image of St. Peter. And what do we see? He's holding the key of heaven. Yeah, because remember what I said? That he is now taking that key up. Uh, to heaven so that the Pope now has ownership over the whole earth. Okay, now uh, another part of the Abbey that's only just been uh, uh, unveiled the last few years actually is what's known as the Cos Cosmati Pavement. It's a mosaic. It uh, was put in there by many Italians that were brought over. Now these weren't just any Metal Italians, these were Italians of certain families, the whole the the esoteric knowledge that hold the uh, alchemy knowledge of what a Cosmati pavement is all about, right slap there in the middle of the abbey where King Charles III and prior monarchs were coronated right on the circle in the middle that talks about ownership of the whole world and authority and power. We didn't see it in Elizabeth II's coronation because it had a big carpet over it. Now they say because it was in uh, disrepair. That's just for us plebs. We didn't even know about it. It's very significant, in my opinion, that it's now exposed today. They're in their end game, people. Time to wake up, time to rise up, time to push back. So it happened uh, in Henry III's time. Uh, he sent the abbot, uh, West, the abbot of Westminster, uh, Richard de Weir, and he travelled to Italy. He had to go to Italy because he needed to be confirmed as ab abbot by the Pope. And he was there um, uh, in his quarters. Uh, some uh, um, documents say that he was actually at the Pope's summer house and he saw this beautiful Cosmati uh, uh, floor there with all its esoteric knowledge. A lot of it are lost to us and are lost to historians, but it'll all be in Vatican Museum. The elites will know. They get a different education. They get the real deal. We just get the false stuff. Um, and so he was given a special dispensation from the Pope himself to have a Cosmati um, um, pavement put into the Abbey there in London, because London is the seat, well, at least the city of London is the seat of the Jesuits. It's owned by the Vatican. Um, so anyway, he, he brings this back, um, and it's right in front of the high altar, the Catholic high altar there in Westminster Abbey with St. Peter there with his key uh, and his pointed uh, ancient mystery religious finger. Um, not only uh, did the abbot Richard de Weir uh, bring not only the Italian workers, but all this precious stone, some from Egypt, some from Rome, some from all over the place, uh, other areas, other places were uh, deconstructed to bring that over. Only the best was brought for this abbey. It was going to be highly significant. Uh, but he's also buried under it. This is what it says on Abbot Richard de Weir's um, resting place. Abbot Richard de Weir, who rests here, now bears those stones which he himself bore hither from the city, the city, Rome, the seat of the Pope, the Vatican. So um, who was the Pope that said, yeah, I endorse this, uh, this pavement? Um, and he was Pope Alexander IV, and he came straight on the heels of Pope Innocent, uh, the first I think he was, who was the most uh, ugliest, um, debauched, 
evil pope that we probably ever had, if that's possible. Um, uh, and he tried to bring the uh, Eastern Orthodox Church and and with you know back to Mother Rome, um, and he established the uh, French Inquisition. If you want to read Fox's Book of Martyrs, you'll know the ugly dealings that went there, the people that were burnt, the people that were tortured, dislocated. Uh, it's an ugly read. Uh, so he set that up. Um, uh, he um, also, uh, September the 27th, uh, always 27th, that's a nice Luciferian number as well. Um, he declared the bull... Uh, the div uh, divination or sorcery bill, a bull, which is the greatest declaration a pope can make, a bull. Um, and he, it was, he was told that the Inquisition were not to investigate anyone in divination or sorcery. Um, leave them alone. Because they were the proponents, the, uh, the uh, means to keeping ancient mystery religion alive. Um, he also, just before he died, uh, issued another papal bull for King Henry, uh, and he absolved King Henry, as if he can do that, uh, and the magistrates of, of King Henry's realm from the oaths taken in what's known as the Provisions of Oxford. And uh, that was an instrument of war to help the barons against tyranny, uh, but that didn't suit the Pope, so the Pope absolved him from those oaths. If the Pope can absolve uh, a king who desires to come under the Pope, which clearly, from what we're seeing, Charles is, and we will learn about that more and more in, in the next part of the series, uh, allow the Pope to have pre um, eminence over him, and he is answerable to the Pope, has Charles been absolved from the oath that we just witnessed. What happened behind those screens, those Luciferic screens with the ancient mystery religion? I spoke about that in the introduction. Uh, one thing perhaps I didn't talk about is the, uh, the wreath underneath that's done in a ribbon form. That goes way back. That does speak about uh, a snake. It represents a snake. That isn't opinion. That is... That is uh, what it is, you'll see that wrapped around all sorts of documentation, uh, including um, uh, the French Revolution there, you know, when we see the Declaration of Human Rights, as if we need that, we've already got that from God, we have those inalienable rights. This Cosmati um, pavement, it's, it's a very sacred space, it holds alchemy, um, it's the knowledge of it's only held by a few families. It goes back to medieval times, so you need to understand what it all means back then. The squares was the material world that we we don't understand that now so much. It's got twenty nine circles. Uh, twenty nine is another significant number. Uh, gene geometric uh, des uh, designs. Now circles are the purest uh, divine um, uh, shape in medieval alchemy and uh, ancient mystery religion uh, and that's why you have a, in the very central you have square and a circle and you have all these curly snake-like uh, mosaic uh, uh, ribboning through and, and going around uh, now this cosmati um, oh, also in the middle there it's, it's got a cross as well so you know all very ancient mystery uh, it predicts the end of the world, right around the edges of it. There's uh, a lot of the, the letters have gone, but there's enough there that historians have been able to make out uh, when it predicts the end of the world by adding up uh, the lifespan of different animals, fish and birds. Um, so it's been covered up since Victorian times, uh, back in the 1870s, uh, and you can be sure it was covered up for a reason, for a reason to be unveiled today. The Cosmati uh, pavement or floor uh, underpins royal power. That's why he had his um, coronation right on top of the middle of it. Two significant icons are there. I don't know if you noticed one on each side. Icons tend to be more orthodox Christianity. 
um, uh, uh, rather than what we would know as Protestant Christianity. Those icons are to be worshipped. To end with, another part that you will see in this abbey is special seating where the monks way back in the day would uh, pray and uh, sing and have their reflection. Interestingly enough, what do we see there? A mermaid, a bare-breasted mermaid. Now, you've got to interpret that in medieval times. When you see a mermaid uh, on a corner of a street or outside a house, that marked a place of prostitution. It was the house of ill repute. It was there because these monasteries were places of debauchery. That's why they were dissolved. Also, we have the uh, Edward the uh, First Coronation Chair. Uh, and Edward, he's buried there. He was known as the Hammer of the Scots because he took over Scotland in 1296. He defeated them, stripping them of their independence. And this is what Rome does, strips everyone. Did so in pagan Rome, does so in papal Rome. Same in New Zealand, same everywhere in the world. You find your moment when they got there. In Britain, the Jesuits really took over with uh, uh, William of Orange. Well, I'm going to leave it there. Uh, next video will be on dress etiquette and regalia, so that's going to be a lot of fun. Then after that, I'm going to look at ceremony, and I'm going to finish with my favorite, I can't wait, which is his stagecoach that he went back to the palace in. You were in for a lot of fun there. So thank you very much for joining me this morning. Uh, bless you, and I will see you in the next video. Bye now.